Hey there, my name is Lexi and thank you so much for joining me today. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing the book More Myself by Alicia Keys, which I just finished about a week ago. I've actually been reading this book for about a month, two months maybe, and I'm so excited to finally be able to finish this book because it's been a long time coming and Alicia Keys is one of my top three influences for my favorite artists. So if this book review is something you're interested in watching, please stay tuned. Overall, I love this book by Alicia Keys because, as I said in the intro, Alicia Keys is in my top three of artists who have influenced me as an artist. There's Aaliyah, Beyonce, and then there's Alicia Keys. And I'm so excited that she decided to drop this book. Um, when did she decide to put this book out? It just came out. It just came out in 2020, so I didn't even know that she dropped it. One of my friends on Instagram uh, from Philly, he actually told me about it and it was like, hey, you should read this book and do more interviews on music people. So when I found that out, and actually it was a gift from him. He goes by Captain on uh, Captain Life of ENT on Instagram. So thank you so much again for buying this book for me. And I'm so happy to have read it because again, Alicia Keys is one of my top three influences. Overall, the book is organized very well. It's written very well, very easy to understand. There are some parts that are very like deep and poetic sounding because Alicia Keys is also a poet. I expected that because I've read her poetry books before. And if you pay attention to how she writes her music, how she sings her songs, she's a very deep thinking person who has that kind of verbiage in her music anyway. So the book sounded exactly how her songs feel, honestly. So it wasn't difficult to read whatsoever. The chapters I felt were the right length, so I felt like I was making progress without them being too long. They were broken down into nice sections, and overall, I loved the order of the book, the way it was written, and there were no grammatical or punctuational mistakes in the book, which I really appreciate. And coming from Alicia Keys, I knew that would be the case because she's all about words, so I knew there wouldn't be any mistakes in her book. But I want to get into some things, my favorite parts of the book, things that really resonated with me. And I actually made a bunch of notes. I'm gonna go through all of them um, as far as like particular pages that really stuck out to me or things that she said that really stuck out to me. So Alicia Keys is very spiritual and in tune with herself, which is like me because I'm always striving to be better. I'm always striving to develop. I'm always looking at parts of myself that could be worked on or parts of myself that could be strengthened. And I really appreciate reading about Alicia Keys and understanding that that's how she is too. She's always seeking the deeper, always seeking the greater meaning. And so to be able to read that about her made me feel closer to her and made me feel like, ah, this is why I love her as an influence so much. When I list my top three influences, Aaliyah, Beyonce, Alicia Keys, I always tell people Alicia Keys because of the soul. And that rang even more true with this book. Some particular examples um, there's one part on page 52 where she says she felt like she couldn't do her best work with producers trying to push up on her. And the thing that she's referencing is in this is that as a woman, we get pushed up on a lot. This is a very male dominated industry and it made me feel even more close to Alicia Keys and it made her more relatable for me because I'm a singer, songwriter, audio engineer. I work in studios all the time and there are just a lot of guys who there's definitely a culture that comes with the music industry where guys feel like almost like women have to do sexual favors for them or there's always a sexual undertone to things like I've had instances where guys would want me to sleep with them to do a song or sleep with them for beats or for studio time or for a mix or something or sleep with me so I can introduce you to this person. That's very much a real thing within the industry. And she was talking about on page 52, not being able to do her best work because you can't concentrate when you have this guy who's supposed to be professional and who is supposed to be helping you. You can't concentrate and write your best and work your best when the focus is not even on the music. So I definitely related to that. Um, there's on page 165, she talks about Prince and he actually gave her 
some solid bit of advice that I'm also gonna take for myself. So let me find it. A lesson from Prince and something to keep in mind. But basically, Prince says, always widen your audience without alienating your core group. So basically, Prince was letting Alicia Keys know that as you get bigger, as your name grows and you become more and more famous, you need to widen your kind of uh, musical ear to account for all of the new people that have joined your fan base. But never forget about the core people who put you on, who made you, who made other people want to get to know who you are. Don't alienate your core group of people. Don't grow so big that you forget about those who helped you get your start in the first place. And I think that's a great piece of advice because I always wonder as an artist, how will I evolve musically to account for all of the different people who are going to become fans of my music? How do I make sure that I am growing as an artist, as a person, but also doing it in a way to where my audience and me can grow together? So I love that piece of advice from Prince. Let me see if I could find the actual line. That happened to me, he went on. Over time, my audience became much more diverse. I'm sure he could see the question splashed across my face. Isn't that good? To this day, I'm amused at the diversity of my audiences. How 67-year-old white men come to concerts with their 15-year-old grandkids. Prince didn't offer a conclusion that day. He was just pointing out the similarity. And then it goes on to say... He continually widened his audience and his artistry without ever alienating his core group. That is my own intention. I want to super serve my most committed tribe, those like-minded listeners who've been with me from the start, even as I push myself artistically and expand my fam. And like I just explained, that's the exact same way that I feel. So I really thought that part was cool. Um, I don't, I would have to research if Prince has, has a book um, unfortunately, I didn't get to see him in concert when he came to Atlanta to the Fox Theater, or maybe he was supposed to come to Atlanta. He performed and then passed away, I think. So I didn't get the chance to experience Prince live in person, but I feel a little closer to Prince in this particular instance in the advice that he gave to Alicia Keys. So the fact that he was one of the guys who kind of guided her um, softly, that's really dope to me. Next thing, resounding yes. I think she was talking to Oprah when it comes to this resounding yes notion. Um, let me see. You know what a resounding yes feels like, she said. It's undeniable. Nothing's going to stop you from doing it. You're excited. You don't have to convince yourself to move forward. You simply know this is the right thing and that is what I live by. I made a lot of decisions from my head. I've chosen to go in this direction or that one based on finances or because something seems like a great opportunity or because I don't want to hurt people's feelings or disappoint them or because someone is pushing me toward an agenda that serves them. But when I've listened to my heart, when I've trusted what my spirit is telling me, that yes has always steered me right. A resounding yes makes your heart rise up. And this part relates to me. I relate to this part a lot because I tend to be in my own head a lot about certain things and that can cause me to, or anybody, that can cause us to not trust our own instincts, trust our own gut feelings. We always want to attach a plan to something tangible or something that other people see fit for us instead of doing what we just feel is going to be right for us. So like she was saying, we attach, oh, I'll do this thing when I make this amount of money or I'll go here when I see this pe these people doing so-and-so. Why don't we just make decisions based on how does it feel? And I understand that that can be very scary because feelings can be temporary, but when you feel that resounding yes, that I need to do this to move forward with my life, I connected to that because that's how I felt when I was coming to Atlanta for the first time, going to the Art Institute of Atlanta to go to school for audio production. I felt in my being of beings that it was the right thing for me to do as a singer and songwriter to be able to learn how to do things in the background of the music industry. And at the time, it was a battle more so with my dad, I think. Um, I don't remember how my moms were reacting back then, how my mom or my stepmom were reacting, but it was a battle. Like I think um, my dad thought that I was dreaming 
but he didn't understand exactly what the degree entailed. But, you know, I pushed through that. We kept talking and talking and talking. Eventually he was convinced like, okay, she's not just going off of a whim of being a singer. So I did have to like convince him um, that, you know, this is a good move for me. But had I just given up and decided like, I can't do audio production because I don't have the approval of other people, then I wonder where I would be right now. That resounding yes for me was, you need to leave Savannah. You need to go to Atlanta because that's where your opportunity is. And seven years later, here I am recording in studios, people paying me to sing for them, people paying me to write music, people <clears throat> people paying me to write music, people paying me to travel and sing. And it just gets better and better and I grow each day. So that's 194, a lot of us are over the fakeness. There's this part on page 211 where she talks about, I think she was talking about her no makeup campaign and I appreciate why she decided to do it because <laughs> basically the, the gist is we're all over the fakeness. So I don't want to wear makeup if I don't feel like wearing makeup. When I decide to wear makeup, yes, I can, but exposing our natural selves, no filter, no makeup, no crazy aesthetics that make us look way different from what we are in our natural state. And I appreciate that because I struggle a lot with seeing a lot of fake things going on for people who are climbing up to be in the industry. And then just, as people would say in Atlanta, it's a lot of cap going on, people acting like they have things that they don't really have. And it's very disheartening. So to hear Alicia Keys say, you know, I'm over the fakeness, I wanted to expose the natural, I wanted to expose the real, that made me feel really good in knowing that someone as of her caliber someone as high up as she is in the music industry can realize that there is a lot of that that goes on and actively did something about it. Maybe not in as direct of a way as like taking on big names in the music industry or culture in the music industry. Well, actually it is a part of the culture in the music industry because for women especially, we have to make sure our hair, I'm wearing fake hair right now. I mean, it's real hair, but I didn't grow it from my head. But anyway, and we as women have to maintain a certain aesthetic. And usually that means the long weave, the long nails, the makeup, the lashes. Um, some women go as far as doing breast augmentations or lip injections, fillers, BBLs, all that stuff. And it's just a lot of people afraid to be who they actually are. So I appreciated Alicia Keys and her no makeup campaign that she did. Because it makes me feel like one of my goals of bringing back that classic 90s beauty, it makes it feel a little more realistic knowing that there are people like her in the industry who so boldly took that stance. What's another one? 215, there's a question that she posed and that stuck out to me. Do you want to be good or do you want to be great? And she says she asks herself that before every performance and I love that because just recently, I'm debating whether I even wanna talk about it on a video or not. I'll let my family know, but I don't know if I want that to be public on like YouTube yet. But I recently gone through um, something that I would say is really traumatic. And it's kind of giving me this attitude of like, fuck it pretty much. When I feel like doing something, it's like, why not? Or when I'm afraid of doing something, I tell myself, fuck it, you've been through Da, da, da why can't you do this? So when I read this, when she asked herself, do you wanna be good or do you wanna be great? I feel like that's kind of my own version of herself asking herself that question. You say you wanna do certain things, why are you holding yourself back? Are you gonna let fear hold you back or are you going to break through that fear and just do it, see what happens? The worst that could happen is you don't do that hot or you fail, but you have to at least try. And do you want to be good or do you want to be great? That my equivalent is fuck it. Why not? Just do it. Like stop holding yourself back. Stop being scary. Stop closing yourself off from things that could be really, really great for you. So I appreciated that question. That's on page 215. Um, page 220. There are a few other things in here 
that I really resonated with. Like, um, and I don't, I don't know if I want to go in and actually read it, but she talks about music being a gateway to connection. And I've always felt that way. I've always said that, you know, music is a way for us to have therapy. Music is a form of therapy. And it's a way for us to let each other know like, hey, we're all going through similar situations. We're not going through it alone. And thank God we're not special in the way that we are not the only ones who have gone through this particular thing. Chances are, whatever it is you're going through, millions of other people have gone through it. So you should take some kind of comfort in knowing that it's been done before those people got through it you'll get through it too. And music is that gateway to connection to where we can all hear it, we can all listen, we can all feel the same feeling and feel connected in the same way. Someone is detailing my life in the form of song, something that I've been through and I relate to this. I feel this. So me and Alicia Keys, we share that same thought process on thinking of music as a way to connect with people. And I'm sure a bunch of other people do too. Um, there's another part in here where she talks about shrinking herself. Let me see. 248. Was it 248? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 248. Another part that I'm gonna give you two more parts that I, that really resonated me with me in this book. Um, this one is on 248. And it's about shrinking ourselves, the idea of shrinking ourselves. And Alicia Keys talks about a few instances where she felt like she had to hold back basically or downplay her needs in certain situations to make herself seem more agreeable or more likable or not difficult. So let me find the passage in here. Rather than basking in the glow of those miracles, I shrank. At certain moments, I even dumbed myself down or chose not to talk about the many blessings I'd received. I feared that if I shared my experience in its entirety, if I took the lid off my joy, it would push others away or make them feel small. As my career progressed, that tendency took another form in my interactions around the industry. I don't need much. Nothing has to be too grand. I'm cool with my little piano, my bench, and a cup of water. In a sense, that was true. I've never been an over-the-top kind of girl, but what's also true is this, some part of my spirit was always signing up for less because this is what I believed I deserved. For many years, I thought I was just being modest. I never wanted to come across as self-absorbed or as someone with a big head. It's how we women are brought up. Don't ask for more, don't take credit, don't outshine others. But there on the couch, it hit me that my alleged modesty was just a disguise, a mask for a lack of self-worth. It was a huge revelation. And this part sticks to me so much because I am still trying to figure out where in my childhood I got this idea. And I think it has to do with honestly the way black kids are typically raised. Kids are supposed to be seen more so than heard. And especially when it comes to being raised in a black family, you don't talk back, You your feelings don't really matter. Um, you just need to go along to get along basically. <laughs> and as bad as that sounds, I think that's, that's the experience for a lot of people. I think that's where it starts for me as far as feeling like I shouldn't be doing too much. I shouldn't be drawing too much attention to myself. And so imagine me pursuing this singing career where I have to garner hell of attention and all eyes have to be on me. But being a shy kid, being the type of kid that doesn't like being in front of a lot of people, I don't even like public speaking. Well, it's not so bad anymore, but I didn't even like public speaking. I just, I didn't want to bring too much attention to myself. I was always a quiet person. I always sat, not necessarily in the back of the room, but I just never wanted to draw too much attention to myself. But I had this dream inside of me to be a singer, to be a great entertainer. And so that part of myself was always conflicting. How can I say I want to be this great person in this field when I'm battling with my introverted nature, my homebody nature, my quiet nature? I'm not the type that's all up in people's faces whenever I go out. I'm chill. I'm laid back. And I wondered, like, at what point do I start recognizing how amazing my talent is and stop shrinking myself to being 
or accepting that this is just who I am. I found myself really becoming dissatisfied with, well, this is just who I am, I'm introverted. And I felt like I'm still in the middle of this journey and it's getting better and better. And as I said, the traumatic event that I went through, it's caused me to want to break out of my shell even more. But, you know, wanting to be a great entertainer, I'm consistently working on opening myself up and knowing that I am so good, owning that I'm good and telling myself I'm great and telling myself that I deserve this, telling myself like, yo, you work hard, you deserve the great things that are coming your way instead of you work hard, work hard in silence and don't make too much noise, don't rub it in people's faces. I'm starting to realize that it is not bragging if it's facts. It's not a flex if it's facts. If you are good at what you do, that's not you bragging. That's not you having a big head. That's you recognizing the greatness in yourself. And I don't know, all throughout childhood, like people tell you, you should be humble and you shouldn't be big headed and you shouldn't make others feel bad by everything that you've accomplished. But as you get older, you stop giving a fuck, honestly. You don't care about other people's feelings, at least for me anyway, this is where I'm at. I stop caring about what people think. I stop caring about people's feelings. I need to be great for me. Sorry. I need to be great for me. And I need to stop putting a lid on myself and limiting myself when I know I'm greater and when I know I'm working to be greater. How can I be greater if I'm not willing to accept greater? So that part of the book really stood out to me. Um, last thing I wanna share with you is a fear that I also share. Alicia Keys talks about her fear of being silenced and put into a box and being misunderstood. And I think that's been my fear for a long time as well. I have always been shy and quiet and I, I've always thought to myself, you know, how are people going to listen to my music when I won't even speak up? How are people going to listen to me when I won't speak up in certain situations? And so that's just another part of myself that I've had to work on. Being introverted and chill, that's cool, but when it comes down to getting things done, I need my voice to be heard. And my music is heard and people do listen to my music and I put messages in my music, but when I want certain things out of life, I don't want to shrink. I don't want to shy away from confrontation just because it might ruffle feathers or it might make some people angry. I don't want to be put into a box. I don't want people to, I don't want to silence myself, let alone other people. I'm starting to realize that this next part I was about to tell you about is just turning more into, I don't want to be shrunken i don't want to shrink <laughs> i don't know how to say um that particular word but let me see for an artist there is no comment more gratifying than you sound like yourself but it's like you like a you i've never heard before i just wanted to be left alone in a room to create an isolation that instinct was mostly about fear fear of having my own voice silenced fear of being misunderstood or squeezed into an artistic box i was never meant to fit in Fear of being emotionally naked in front of another person. In seven albums, I've come full circle. These days, the fear has been replaced with a sense of freedom. So I think maybe I also suffer from a fear and that's maybe why I don't always love being in the room working with other people because I don't want them to take over how I want to say things. Um, and I think it stops me from collaborating I don't necessarily love being in the room with others for that reason. I don't want my ideas to be shunned or silenced just because I'm trying to appease to others and be a people pleaser. But again, th these are traits that I'm working on in myself to be better at and to be able to voice what I want without having to step on toes, but saying it firmly enough to where people are like, you know, okay, this is what Lexi wants. We need to take into consideration, at least take into consideration what she wants. But, um, I'm running out of time on my camera, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this review. Overall, as I said, I love this book. I'm so happy that Alicia Keys came out with this book because she is one of my top three influences. Now I'm just waiting on Beyonce, honestly. And I need to see if there is a book by Aaliyah. 
but let me know what you think about this book review of More Myself by Alicia Keys. Let me know if any of the points that I mentioned that resonated with me, if they resonated with you. Let me know if you are going to read this book yourself. And in the comment section down below, let me know who is the next artist that I should read about. What's the next biography or autobiography that I should read? Other than that, thank you so much for watching this book review. Please give me a big thumbs up, comment in the comment section down below, subscribe and hit the bell for the notification to be notified each and every time I post a new video. Until next time, my name is Lexi. Peace.